want to welcome everybody here today. We have a little bit of housekeeping chores as usual to go through. In the unlikely event that we should have some type of an emergency, there are exits to your rear on the north side of the building and at each end of the hall to your right, and of course the front door as well. For those of you who haven't been here before, the restroom facilities are to the right, down the hall to your right, to the left for the ladies, and straight down the end on the left for the gentlemen. The uh, program we're going to uh, have the opportunity to hear this morning from Ms. McKeon is from a rather unique perspective, I think. Uh, when we talk of war, it's usually very male-centric, is it not? And North Carolina was a very reluctant partner to the Southern Secession Movement in 1860 and 1861. It took three times before the people of North Carolina would be convinced that they should leave the Union made so dear to them by their grandfathers. In fact, it only uh, seriously registered on the people of North Carolina how weighty a matter it was until Fort Sumter was fired upon in April of 1861. North Carolina Governor John W. Ellis, uh, when he received a telegram from President Lincoln and the War Department informing him of what North Carolina's quota of troops would be to put down the rebellion. Uh, the final line of Governor Ellis's response to President Lincoln was, you shall get no troops from North Carolina. North Carolina may have been reluctant to join the Southern Confederacy, but when she did, she committed fully. Almost 140,000 North Carolinians would serve the Southern calls during the war, and nearly 40,000 of those would never return home. Per capita, it is said that North Carolina supplied more troops than any southern state during the war. So, what happened to those people left behind? The wives, the sisters, the mothers, the girlfriends, the aged and infirm men, the young men, those not of military age or capacity to serve. They were left home often in a rather dire and defenseless state. And probably one of the greatest testimonies to North Carolina and its commitment to the Southern cause was what the women endured and did for those men in the field during those four long years of warfare. So, without laboring the point any further, I'll turn it over to the expert in the matter, Mrs. Brenda McKeon. I'd like to start out with an advertisement in a newspaper from the time period. This, this guy is looking for a wife. Okay, his ad said, any gal what's got a cow, a good feather bed fixings, $500 in hard pewter, one that's had the measles, one that understands tender children can have a customer for life. <laughs> By writing a billy dove addressed to the initials ZR and stick it on um, Uncle Ebenezer's barn. Now, does anybody here have any uh, ancestors with those initials, Z and R, and do you know where Uncle Ebenezer's barn is? I thought that was right funny. So people back then advertised for a mate, just like they do in today's uh, world. <clears throat> uh, the war affected everybody, no matter your age, your sex, or your color. It was pure hardship for families without a male figure at home, uh, whether the soldier was uh, lost due to disease or wounds. The South was a patriarchal society. Uh, the females depended on the male of the family to protect them. When the war came, everything changed. 
um, the women wanted a male figure to, uh, if their, so their husband was a soldier, to help uh, answer questions when she would write him, whether uh, what time of the year to plant, where to plant it, uh, if, if taxes were due, preparing for the winter, etc. Now, it was quite common at the time for the wife and the children to move in with relatives once the, hus the soldier was uh, in the war. Some uh, references called for a house that was filled with many women, maybe an elderly man, and lots of children. Uh, the women were afraid to be left at home because of a slave uprising, but in my research, I've failed to find any uh, slave revolts during that period. In fact, it was the slave people who helped guard the white people. Uh, when the federal soldiers were released from Salisbury P prison and marched down to the east, they made comments to their uh, folks at home about how uh, the, they found all these women in the houses and uh, hardly saw any males around unless it would be a young boy or an elderly gentleman. And um, this was because um, the, all, the men were either volunteered or conscripted and uh, that left, left a lot of ladies and their families at home. One woman wrote that there was not a white male within 10 miles of her home. Uh, with the influx of the Federals down east in 1862, the families there became refugees to the interior of the state and they settled in like Granville and Orange and uh, Vance County, which was uh, not a Vance County at the time period. And when they came, if they were wealthy, they brought their slaves with them. And there's reports of some families in Orange County really upset because all these foreigners were coming to live in their neighborhood. And they weren't really foreigners, they were just people, refugees from down east. Uh, and also, uh, when Wilmington got too big and, and uh, such a vice city that uh, those refugees went to uh, Red Springs and Lumberton and Fayetteville. And then of course you had your refugees who fled Sherman when he came into the state. Now the first year of the war featured women uh, in patriotic exhaustion. They just couldn't, they wanted to help but they just couldn't do enough and they uh, formed aid societies some of them met once a week, some of them twice a week, and some of them met every day, and uh, they just could not do enough. Uh, and I found out that during my research that even some of the slaves contributed to the war effort, and I found these uh, references in the newspapers. They would print the name of the woman or the slave and what they contributed I'm going to pass around these two papers and let you see. It even mentioned the name of the slave, which I thought was very unusual. Uh, towards the end of 1861, the impressment agents came around to collect a type. One-tenth of their meat and produce was collected for military use. Uh, some of the things that they collected would be corn, bacon, rice, buckwheat, peanuts, beans, peas, potatoes, cotton, molasses, and fodder. And even later on, they impressed wood uh, for the campfires and wool. Uh, farmers could take their share of their tithe to collection points or uh, the farmer could have somebody to come around uh, with a wagon and it was said that these wagons were just piled as high as they could with all these different things that were used for the military. Um, they called these agents impressment thieves or the army worm when they came around. The, the, uh, by 1863, the army depended on mostly these impressments and the tax in kind was abolished in North Carolina in 1864. 
but by then the central government in Richmond was collecting 50% of the farmer's meat and produce and 75% of his corn. So that left little food for the family. And I can understand why the farmers chose to hide their, their cattle and horses and their produce in the woods. And the bad thing about it was that they collected it from the soldier's wife too, who had even less. Not only did they impress what I'd mentioned, but they impressed the slaves. If you had slaves, they would uh, come by and say, we need six hands to work on fortifications, like down at Fort Branch and Fort Fisher. And um, the, the person that owned the slaves, if, if the slave died on the job or ran away, then the Confederate government had to pay him for the value of that particular slave. And the owner of the slave got the money from the government just for uh, working on these railroads and hospitals and forts. The agents were also known to impress horses, wagons, buildings, homes, private property, and tools. And uh, the people in the beginning of the war could sell their guns and rifles to the quartermaster and uh, people could rent out slaves to work on, on these uh, agencies. So as soon as Lincoln put a blockade on, inflation started at 10% each month, and it continued that throughout the war. Uh, it seemed like the, a seller could get a better price if he crossed state lines, like for instance, a man uh, had a wagon load of uh, produce he was going to sell and he could get higher prices if he crossed the line into South Carolina. And uh, this, this caused a, a hardship in North Carolina. The, the merchant had in, in the cities had to take an oath that what he had for sale was, was not for a resale so he could get a higher price. And the legislature passed bills to prohi prohibit the exportation of these things outside of state lines. And they made a contract with the woolen and cotton mills to produce all of their cloth and yarn for the military use. And they were not to uh, make more than 75% profit. And at, in 1860, North Carolina had 39 cotton mills and seven woolen mills, which were turned over uh, for the military use. Now, a list of these for, forbidden items that could not leave the state was posted on the courthouse door or in the newspapers. Those who chose the, to ignore these laws were arrested, the goods confiscated, and they were fined. And the, the, these uh, articles that were forbidden were changed frequently and posted uh, for the public to see. <coughs> there was a man in Warrington that bought out the entire contents of a store just so he could raise prices and be in control. Uh, gr the grocers refused uh, and merchants refused to credit in 1861. They wanted to be paid in gold and silver coins, which uh, people start to hoard. Thank you. Um, bartering was the way to do business. To give you an example, if, if uh, you had two or three hogs and your neighbor had a loom and you didn't know how to weave and you needed fabric, then she or he would trade one hog for, say, nine yards of fabric. So there was very little money exchanged hands. And to further complicate things, each state printed their own paper money, and uh, merchants r would refuse to accept uh, these paper money from a different state. So. If you had a, a, a guy from South Carolina came into North Carolina to buy goods and all he had was Confederate money, 
the merchant would refuse to take it. As early as May of 1861, shortages appeared. Uh, by August of 61, there was no coffee or sugar found in Wilmington. Salem residents discontinued their August, uh, their love feast with the coffee and sugar cake. The coffee was so hard to find. Uh, by late spring, the mountain counties keenly felt the shortages uh, and by winter of 1862, it became severe. Uh, this was due to the lack of manpower and uh, very few slaves compared to the Piedmont and the down east, and they had problems harvesting their crops if it had been planted. And then uh, civilians donated both money and provisions in excess, so by late 1862, they became destitute in some areas, and I thought this is much earlier than I had anticipated the shortages starting in the state. So what's a family to do? Again, you would go to bartering. Up in Ash County, people traded wood for salt at Saltville, Virginia. Your private schools and academies uh, accepted bacon and corn in lieu of tuition as long as the student brought their own linens and books and candles. Uh, as another example, a grocer would take produce, critters, tobacco, wool, or lumber in lieu of money. Uh, the arsenal in Fayetteville employed 50 to 90 women, and instead of giving them money for their work, they gave them fabric, alpaca, alpaca fabric and these ladies could sell it if they needed to. Uh, even the woolen mills bargained for raw wool, wood, food, and hay in exchange for bundles of spun thread. And the paper mills would advertise in the paper that people could bring in their old cotton and linen rags uh, and, and exchange it for stationery or newspapers. So very little money exchanged hands. But when it did, as the war came, uh, moved along, the currency was devalued. So the women had to become the breadwinners in the family, and there were very few respectable jobs for females, according to the Victorian times of the period. It was uh, okay for a lady to run a boarding house, be a teacher, teach music, be a seamstress, etc., cetera, laundress, but if you had to go out and work in a factory, that was looked down upon. That was considered to be lower class families if you had to work in the mills. And they, uh, they did employ a lot of women and children in these mills. And um, women also worked for the railroad, for the clerk's office. Um, they worked in the flour mills, uh, grist mills, and some, uh, some worked as nurses, some in the tobacco business, and then others turned to prostitution out of pure desperation to survive. The first year shortages of salt um, prompted the establishment of salt factories along the uh, coast. These were located around Moorhead City in that area, but when the Federals moved in, in 1862, these private salt factories shut down and uh, the state built a uh, state salt factory on Topsail Island. And it was said that they burned 120 cords of wood a day. Uh, they had these large iron pans set up and they boiled the seawater to get the salt out of it. Uh, one gallon of seawater will equal one-fourth pound of salt. Salt sold uh, for a, a bushel in Wilmington for $19, whereas in Raleigh, the same sack would be $75. Now, why is salt so important? Can you? That's right. Most people think, well, it's used for flavoring, but no, the, it was to cure your meat, and it was also used in the tanning of hides. 
uh, a person would use a hundred pounds of salt to cure a thousand pounds of pork. And that would be what about three pigs for a thousand pounds, good sized pig. And let, let yeah. <laughs> I think we can get, what, a 90-pound pig when you do a pig picking for one family. So one sack of salt weighs 150 pounds. Um, the people in, in the mountain counties, like here, would go up to Saltville, Virginia, to the salt mines and get their uh, salt. And I got real tickled when I read this, but there was a traffic jam going into Saltville of these wagons and the mules and the horses pulling the wagons. Can you imagine a 19th century traffic jam? <laughs> Those stories about people digging up the dirt in their smoke houses to extract the salt are true. That's not, not made up, but that I came upon this over and over and over again. And the salt wouldn't be white, it'd be kind of a brown color, but salt is salt. Now, <clears throat> There were different types of relief agencies uh, that were set up during the war. Some of them were set up by county, and uh, there was a re relief agent in uh, the district. I think it was divided into seven districts. They kept the names of the uh, families and the number of their children. And the captain of the militia kept a list of the names, and. Uh, one family, a, rather, a family with one child got three pecks of corn and four pounds of bacon a month. Now, four pounds of bacon for a month wouldn't last long in, in my son's house. I think he, he could eat a pound a day if, if, if his wife would let him. But uh, the more children you had, the more uh, handout you got. Sometimes they would get vegetables if, if it was in season. And uh, also, if needed, a soldier's wife received a ration of corn, bacon, salt, wool, and uh, combs, or wool carters. And do you all know what a, car, a comb, wool comb is? We've got some here in the museum. I think there's some uh, over there by that loom. But it's the, the comb where you... This is the first step in making cloth. You have to get that wool in. Yeah, he's holding one up. Mine's in storage, so I, I usually bring one along to show people. But that's called a card, C-A-R-D, or a comb. And you can uh, use it to straighten out the fibers and get the trash out of the wool. That's necessary before you can spin it. At the beginning of the war, these cost 25 cents a pair. But at the end of the war, if you could find them, they cost $125. Remember that the soldier, private soldier only made $11 a month. Now how's his wife gonna afford to pay for that when food's more important? Uh, now if you didn't have any children, you got no relief unless it would be family. But you were not uh, allowed to to take charity off of these uh, relief agents. And in some state, if the soldier died, his family was disenrolled. So that meant that the wives and kids could not get the, the food that they needed. Uh, some counties chose to distribute money instead of uh, s delivering food, much like our food stamps, they would give them these papers but this proved to be unwise because of the rate of inflation. Uh, during the war, 40% of white women and two-fifths of the civilians were on handouts from the government. So that's kind of like today, I think. There's more and more people on charity. The government printed in the newspapers for people to grow more corn and wheat instead of cotton and tobacco. Uh, which they did, and there was never enough food and even less meat. And one fellow said he went all through the war without drinking any milk, and another one said they rarely had any uh, meat. Uh, people ate a lot of field peas and peanuts. The average diet in the South, in, in our state, consisted of hominy, field peas, cornbread, and sorghum. 
and that was repeated over and over again, you know, if you didn't have a garden. Um, I found two instances of something called a blockade diet. One, the first one said it uh, consisted of a corn dodger and har harmony. The second one said one biscuit with honey, and that was it. I had a friend of my father's that told me, uh, he, he grew up in the Depression, he said uh, a lot of nights all they had to eat was cornbread and buttermilk, which I love myself, mixed up together in a glass, eat it with a spoon. <laughs> Young people had what they called starvation parties. They had music there and they had dancing, but they didn't have any refreshments. All they had was water. And another name for these was called a cold water walk around. And I found out that two hogs could feed a family of five for the winter. If you could, if you could get hogs. Uh, outside of a Wilmington Railroad station where corn was distributed to the soldiers' wives, this person commented, I never saw so many carts, some pulled by horses or mules, some by oxen, and all the drivers were women waiting their turn. They looked very desperate. Even the, the wives and children of Cherokee soldiers in the mountains were starving, and they were eating weeds and the bark off of trees. They had no relief. In Rowan County, a relief agent was unable to uh, buy corn and wheat for 750 families, which included 1,200 children under the age of 10. Um, and another uh, instant I found that was kind of revolting was the, uh, they found out that the people ate the grains of corn that the cavalry, the horse cavalry, had dropped out of their mouth. And uh, even worse than that, they, some people, I, I found two instances of where the people went into the manure and picked out grains of corn and washed it and ate that. That's how desperate they were. Uh, a horse or a mule for one day eats four to six quarts of grain and six to 10 pounds of fodder, and that's a lot of food. And most of the time, even the horses were like mere skeletons. And the uh, Virginia cavalry would come sweep down into the mountains where they would uh, get this corn and uh, fodder. And it made Governor Vance very angry because the people needed the food themselves. And he wrote to Davis, he butted heads with Jeff Davis all the time about uh, the troops coming and raiding into our state. They even came and recruited men and got animals and mules and things. Uh, when these, the cavalry came, it was uh, related that it was like the locust swarms uh, and the stories in the Bible. People had to sell their stock because they couldn't afford to feed them. And uh, one Union soldier who was stationed down east wrote home, he said, I know the truth of reports of famine among them. Day after day, men, women, and children come into our lines to get into Newburn to buy bread and to beg to be allowed to enter the lines. The women weeping and their children crying for food, but it cannot be. Many of them are spies, and we cannot sacrifice our cause to alleviate the suffering of a minority, but it can't last long. The men will not stand idly by and see their wives, mothers, and children dying of hunger. But that's a quote from a federal soldier. Uh, in 1863, inflation and shortages of everything and people at home became dissatisfied with the war effort. So they started writing letters to their ministers, to the militia captains, to the government legislatures, to the preachers, etc. They began to criticize the uh, government very bad, even in letters uh, in, in the newspapers. And Nancy Mangan wrote Governor Vance that if he didn't lower the prices, 
we women would write for our husbands to come home. And they did. Another woman wrote, Here I am without one mouthful to eat for myself and five children, and God only knows where I will get some. Now you know as well as you have a head that it's impossible to whip the Yankees. My husband has been killed, and if they all stay till they are dead, what in the name of God will become of us poor women? Another letter to Governor Vance. We are all soldiers' wives and mothers. How far will $11 go in a family now when meat is more than a dollar a pound? She says, we are willing to work and do work early and late to keep starvation, which is staring us in the face. But the government only allows me 50 cents a pair for lined pants. She was sewing for the government to make ends meet. 50 cents a pair for lined pants and 75 cents for coats. And she says, I can't make more than a dollar a day. Most of us have four to five children. Now, sir, we ask you in the name of God, how are we to live? The price did increase in 1863. They started, the ladies started getting a dollar and a quarter for a pair of pants, a dollar and a half for a coat, 75 cents for shirts, and 50 cents for drawers. The sewing machine had been invented, and that, was a, that did save a lot of labor, but the problem was getting the right size thread to go through the machine. Because you know, some machine, if you're a seamstress, you know some machines won't sew if the thread is too thick. Meat for the military grew uh, just as short. Uh, General Lee wrote to War, uh, Secretary of War Seddon about their lack of meat for the troops. I think they only had like one or two days left and some of the soldiers deserted because they weren't getting fed. Uh, General Lee suggested that the Confederacy make a pact with the North to trade cotton and tobacco for cattle, which they did. There was never enough food for citizens and military alike. We had bad weather during that time period, droughts, fires, and further shortages of harvest. Farmers found out that they could make uh, more money selling corn and grain to the distillers. The distiller would pay $5 a barrel, I mean, excuse me, for a peck of, uh, a bushel of corn, whereas the government would only give the farmer 80 cents a bushel. So which are you going to choose? Well, naturally, you're going to go to the higher price. Uh, during the war, we had, we had 87 counties, and out of these, there were 435 private distilleries. So you can imagine the amount of food that's going to make whiskey. The state distillery in Salisbury made whiskey and brandy for medicinal purposes. Army regulations allowed 10 gallons of whiskey per month to be doled out to a thousand sick men. It had to be kept under lock and key uh, at all times because people would pilfer it. And I think the matrons of the hospital carried the keys because even some of the surgeons were known to get into this whiskey. The state distillery in Salisbury used a thousand bushels of corn, a hundred bushels of wheat, and 60 bushels of rye each month to make 200 to 500, 500 gallons of whiskey a day. And uh, I found out that one bushel of corn would make three gallons of alcohol. There were laws passed. Uh, at first it was uh, okay to, you know, to sell certain amounts in your taverns and saloons, but uh, as the newspapers kept printing people to quit using, quit selling to the distillers and instead save it for food. Uh, the legislatures got involved and they, uh, you know, soldiers and alcohol don't mix well together. And so the women took it upon themselves to bash in the, the barrel heads with their axes. 
uh, pour it in the drain in the street, just like Carrie Nation did in the 20th century. So the women were active to get rid of all this alcohol. Uh, most of the private distilleries shut down, but I think when Stoneman came through Salisbury, he destroyed the state distillery. Uh, uh, with the inflation rising at 10% a month, the merchant would uh, raise his price upon the reach of uh, most soldiers' pay, which we mentioned was $11. This led to food riots. Now, if you've done any research on the war, you're, the most popular food riot was Richmond. Well, here in North Carolina, we had over 50 food riots. And the first one was in Salisbury a group of uh, 60 to, uh, rather 40 to 60 civilians went into town with their clubs, their axes, and weapons, their farm implements, but no, no guns, and, and raided Mr. Brown's store because he wouldn't sell uh, the corn and the grain to the soldiers' wives at government prices. So they tore his door down and stole a lot of the stuff in his uh, store. Now, no one was injured, but the local militia was called out to quell the mob. Uh, some of the women got away with flour and wheat, but you had a few that broke open the store next door and stole some bonnets. Well, <laughs> this created such an uproar that the whole incident was printed in the newspapers. And Mrs. Moore, who was uh, the leader of the so-called gang, found it necessary to write a letter to Governor Vance uh, apologizing for the behavior of the ladies. Now this happened again in Greensboro, only the women were a little bit smarter. They had uh, a great number that came in from the west part and then the, uh, they divided kind of like a flank movement and the others came in from the east. And some of these were carrying pistols and they came in with their axes and their clubs and stuff. And uh, the ones from the western part of the town were uh, stopped before they did any damage. And, uh, but the ones from the east were successful and again they broke up when they broke down the doors and stole some grain and wheat. They were arrested, but they didn't hold them very long. And there was a lady named Sally Southall Cotton, who was a student at Edgeworth Cemetery, Seminary, and um, she witnessed all of this from the roof, so we have a good description of that. Angry women not only stormed grocery stores, private plantations, and, but government warehouses as well. Disorderly females attacked the stores in High Point, Boone Hill, Bladen County, Johnson County, Ash County, Wilmington, Yadkin, and Yancey counties. There was a mill in Orange County, uh, I think it was a cotton mill, that was uh, the, the scene of outrages later that year. The women wanted to buy wool and cotton yarn at government prices, but the mills were under contract just to turn out their goods for the military. But they did decide to set aside one day of the week that they would sell to the public. And again, you had these ladies lined up before dawn to, to get some of these, uh, some of the yarn. Uh, and again, you had your traffic jam with these women lined up with their buggies and baskets to get the yarn. Some of them walked for many miles. And there was an employee at a high, high point uh, cotton mill that wrote a, a description of them to a friend. He says, we are generally rushed there for cotton and cloth. Such a mess as they have there. Such pulling, growling, grumbling, and cursing you hardly ever heard. It is impossible to supply half the yarn and cloth that they want and it's a shuffle as who should have it. The company is abused at round rates and threatened with burning because we cannot, after running night and day, supply all that come for yarn and cloth. This reminds me of Black Friday. 
everybody rushing me. <laughs> it happened in the 19th century. Uh, a bunch of yarn is five pounds, and it can be made into 15 yards, and it sold, one bunch sold for 80 to $100. Now just think back, $11 a month for this private soldier's pay. Uh, I've already mentioned the cotton and wool combs, were in, which were in short supply. A lot of them came in through the blockade, and it wasn't until the last year of the war that a company in Fayetteville uh, learned how to make them. And, uh, they were distributed first to the soldier's wife and then sold to the public. Let's see, a little trivia here. Uh, one good carter, that's a lady that's combing the wool or the cotton. Uh, can card one pound of cotton. And a cotton bale, you know, like out in the field, uh, is 500 pounds. She could do one, one pound of cotton. A good weaver can make six to nine yards a day. And I'm thinking, oh, my poor back sitting up there doing that. Uh, to wear homespun was considered very patriotic. And the women, uh, some women did shun goods that came in through the blockade. Uh, and this was just like the Rev War ladies that shunned British-made goods. Uh, many times it was the slave of the family who knew how to weave and spin because the, you could, uh, before the war you could go to a merchant and buy bolts of cotton and you could buy lots of pre-made things like you know, candles and stuff. So they were retrieved their spinning wheels and their looms out of the attic and had new looms made in order to make cloth. Um, women and children made, and, and black people made good smugglers and spies. Who's going to notice a colored man in camp? They were everywhere. And contrary to popular belief, 10 to 15 percent of black people could read and write, even though it was illegal to teach them. They could uh, rely, go, go in camps and count the number of cannons or how many men and, and go back to the Federals and, and uh, give them that information. One of North Carolina's most famous spy, lady spy, was Emmeline Piggott from Moorhead City. And remember this, she was, uh, that part of the state was under federal occupation. Um, she would carry mail. She was around 22 years old, single. She would carry mail and contraband articles underneath her skirt. Now, you all have seen these re reenactors that have the big hook skirts. You could hide a lot of stuff under there, lots of, because they had petticoats with pockets in them, and they could go and, uh, to the merchant and buy things and hide them in, the, in their pockets. And then when they would get back to the line, separating the Confederates from the Federals, the provost guard would ask him, ma'am, are you carrying any contraband? He wouldn't dare touch her because these were the Victorian times. And she would say, no, sir, nothing. And she would get her pass and go on and go back home and get in the Confederate lines and maybe go to the hospital and unload her petticoats and take out morphine and quinine and mail and whatever. So she was a good spy. Um, for one, the last year of the war she was caught. She had been suspected all along, but never did they have any goods for her. So in the last year of the war she was caught. And uh, they, they said they were going to get this black woman to search her because, like I said, the man would not dare touch a lady back during those periods. And she said, no, she said, you can't do that. You go get a white woman and I'll let, let her search me. Well, this was just a ploy so she could delay time, so she could destroy part of the evidence. But she was able to destroy the mail. But once they did search her, this is what they found under her skirt. One pair of boots, two pair of pants, a shirt, a navel cap, 12 handkerchiefs. 12 collars, 50 spools of thread, needles and pins, toothbrushes, combs, two knives, a razor, five pounds of candy, 
and several pairs of gloves. One, that's one time. So she was put uh, in jail down in Newburn, and uh, they never did bring her to trial because she had sent word back. She was dealing with these northern businessmen, which was illegal to, you know, to trade certain items. She apparently got the word back to them that if she went down, they would go down and they would lose their business and be shipped back north. So she never went to trial, but she was jailed for several days. Uh, it was a war against neighbor against neighbor. We had many union sympathizers in the state. Murders and burnings occur occurred frequently. Randolph County was the worst of all these counties because there were more deaths from, from murder in that uh, county. You had to be careful who you talked to so that uh, they didn't know which, which way at first that you were going to lean, whether you were for the Confederacy or for the Union. Uh, Union sympathizers were sent to, civilians were sent to Salisbury Prison. And these included a lot of your Quakers. Uh, North Carolina was the state that had the most Quakers in the South. And many of these left before the war and, and went to uh, Ohio and Indiana and Illinois. Uh, these Quakers had come to North Carolina from uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland. And I do have uh, proof that some of these at first did own slaves. In collecting impressed produce and doling out charitable goods, some members of the militia or the Home Guard acted on old grudges against their neighbors, thereby refusing them a handout. And this is kind of like the Hatfields and the McCoys that were feuding before the war. And well, like I said, some of the militia officers would refuse to dole out uh, food and cotton cards uh, if they were for the Union or if their husband was for the Union. There was a secret, a secret society in the state called the Heroes of America. Are any, anybody familiar with this term, Heroes of America? Another name that they were given was called Red Strings. These were men with Union sympathies and uh, they had a secret signal, uh, kind of like the Mason, the Freemasons. And they also would wear a red string under their lapel. So if you saw somebody out in public, you know, they did, did like that, you knew that they were a member of the secret society. Uh, some of them were more militant than others, causing their neighbors problems with the burning and the, and the murders. W.W. Uh, Holden, who was the editor of the Raleigh Standard, which was a newspaper in Raleigh that was for the Union, uh, he printed a lot of inflammatory stories uh, inciting people that were uh, on the fence whether to go for the Confederacy or the Union. And uh, the soldiers hated him. He also was for peace movements and tried to get people to come in different communities and hold peace meetings to end the war. And then you had uh, men called buffaloes. Are you familiar with the term buffalo? Some of you are. Well, these operated down east. Uh, and in doing the research for my book, I found out that uh, the, the federal soldiers down east did just as much damage as Sherman did on his march through the state. <laughs> Trees were down, fields barren, homes burned. Even the Quaker homes down, in, down east got pillaged and, and uh, things were stole from them. You had to take an oath to the U.S. to do business within occupied lines if you refused you could be exiled from the state, I mean, from that area. And there's uh, many families, especially women and children, who would not take the oath to the U.S. that were uh, exiled out of New Bern. Sherman is still a dirty word in the state because he made war on women and children. Uh, the stories about the bummers hanging up old men and children and slaves to reveal where their valuables were hidden was true. 
Uh, I don't know how many civilians lost their lives on this march. It's hard to tell, but um, he did. He did actually, I think, hang up like a 10-year-old boy and a 12-year-old boy to make him confess where his father or his grandfather had hidden his watch. And also, the bummers stole things from the slaves. They they entered their house and, and stole from them. Uh, it took an army three days, this is Sherman's army, three days to pass. Uh, his train was 25 miles long and it, it contained over 200 wagons and they were living off the countryside. Uh, the bummers preceded the military and they would span out 20 to 30 miles going to the farmhouses and the plantations and collecting uh, forage and committing depredations. Now some people would stand up to them, others were afraid, and uh, some of them even left their homes, and those empty houses were usually burned, but if you were occupying your house when Sherman came through, sometimes it wasn't as bad. Now there's a true story about this little old lady sitting on her front porch watching all these soldiers go by, and I think it may have been Sampson County, and. Uh, these bummers came up to her house and this cocky small man officer came up and put a pistol to her head and said, tell me where your valuables are hidden. Well, that made her so mad she could have bit a 10 penny nail in two. She grabbed him and threw him across her lap and spanked him. <laughs> now that's a true story. Well, he even then he got incensed, so he jumped up and put the pistol back to her head and cocked it. And his men were down in the yard just laughing like crazy, and they said, don't you touch a hair on her head. I said, she's got a lot of spunk, you leave her alone. So they left without stealing anything or doing any damage. But that, I, I guess I would have, I don't know what I would have done if I was faced with the enemy, but I, I think I might go like that little old lady. <laughs> Now, people ask me about the Quaker men. Some of them could pay a $300 bounty to get out of the service for a little while at first. If they didn't have the money, then uh, there were uh, neighbors who would collect, and the church would give them the money. There was one uh, Quaker who was fairly rich up in Richmond, and he would also send money down to North Carolina. Um, now, as the war drug on and the, the ranks got real thin, some of these Quaker men were conscripted and some of them were sent to the hospitals to work and some of them were sent to the salt factory in Topsail Island. Uh, two of them, I found out, went in the ranks on the march to Gettysburg. They refused to carry a gun and uh, they would, they, their, captain or somebody, the sergeant, whatever, would uh, strap them with a gun, try to make them fight. They wouldn't fight. Um, they did get close to Gettysburg, but somehow during one skirmish before they got there, um, they, they were able to escape and they went to Indiana. Uh, the, the northern people helped them escape and they went to Indiana where their wives had already settled. Uh, some of the, I think some of them were sent to Salisbury Prison for a while. Now we have uh, four documented female soldiers from North Carolina and uh, the doctors at the beginning uh, when they were recruiting did a very poor job of examining these recruits. <laughs> So I think they checked their teeth and asked them if they had hernias or something. No, okay, you're good. There was a uh, lady from the mountain area named Melinda Blaylock that a lot's been written about her. Uh, she went by the name of Sam Blaylock, uh, cut her hair short, followed her husband uh, into the war as his brother. And they were stationed down in Kinston and uh, they, they decided they didn't want to be in the Confederacy anymore. So the story goes that 
her husband Keith uh, rolled around in poison ivy, poison oak, and got all these big water blisters, and the doctors didn't know what was wrong. They dismissed him. So when he left, she had to confess that she was a female. Of course, she's automatically rejected. And then they settled, uh, went back home and started uh, creating havoc up in the mountains in their neighborhood, uh, causing war on Confederate families. Now, she was wounded, and she quit the marauding, and her husband continued, and I understand he got shot in the eye and still continued to be a guerrilla. Uh, there's another one, le less known, uh, named Lucy Thompson, who was part Indian from Bladen County. She was in the 18th North Carolina. A tall uh, lady followed her husband, cut her hair short, followed her husband, and uh, did some battles up in Virginia. And it said that she was wounded and had a steel plate put in her head. And while she's in the hospital, the doctors didn't know she was a female. Even her, uh, her second husband, she married a Union volunteer, I mean a Union veteran after the war. He didn't know that she had been a soldier. And when she was lying on her deathbed, she confessed to the preacher that she was a member of the 18th North Carolina. And then the word got out, oh, Granny's been in the war. She's a veteran, you know. <laughs> She was in her 90s then, and darn if she didn't live 10 more years. <laughs> so, uh, down in, oh, they moved to Georgia. She and her uh, veteran husband moved down to Georgia. And uh, there's a bridge and a UDC camp named after her down there. Um, I guess this concludes. I've got 1,200 pages trying to put it in one hour talk here. Has anybody got any questions? Well, most of it, or I would say 99% of what I've talked about is in my books, and they're well documented. So. I don't know. I don't want to be telling any secrets, particularly amongst lady folks, but I probably had the privilege of knowing Brenda well over 30 years, and her traveling companion behind her, Linda Humphreys, an equal number of years. And uh, personally, I want to thank both of you for all of your efforts for most of your adult lives, I suppose, in documenting the story of the women folk back at home and all the sacrifices and suffering that they endured. Uh, had it not been for folks like yourself, I don't know many people would realize what had been involved during those tumultuous times. But at any rate, if we could give them a, both of them, would, would both of you ladies stand, please? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as Brent pointed out, both of her books are available here. I'm sure she'd be happy to inscribe a copy if you want them. Uh, I, I've been researching North Carolina's role in the Civil War for decades, and she's compiled as much information in two volumes than I would have ever imagined could have been possible. She's been very thorough in coming through private correspondence, uh, newspaper accounts, and I uh, don't think you'll find that kind of information anywhere else in one place for sure. But again, I appreciate everybody coming out for the program today and I uh, want to mention to you that on October 8th, which is a Saturday, uh, Miss Nora Brooks will be performing her one-woman play here at the museum uh, about, uh, now, now Bobby wants me to say Mrs. Stonewall Jackson. But her name was Mary Anna Morrison Jackson, young lady from down the road in Lincoln County. So uh, local connection there too. But she'll be doing her one woman play here at the museum. We heartily welcome and encourage you to come out for that. It's a fascinating uh, performance and I think y'all would enjoy it. Seven o'clock in the evening and tickets are uh, $10 for seniors and $12 for everybody else. And 
We'll be happy to sell you a couple before you leave today if you wish. But uh, again, uh, welcome everybody to uh, meet Brenda and Linda personally and ask them any questions you might have. They're a, both a font of knowledge, I'll assure you. Thanks again for coming, folks. Donations to our Caldwell Heritage Museum will be appreciated. That's 112 Vaden Street, Lenore, North Carolina, 28645. Thank you.